now, it says one flesh in marriage produces the exact same result as when all of the male and female components were housed in one body of flesh. So when we see that a man and a woman are to become one flesh, it is in the same sense that God originally brought humanity into existence, where all of the male and female uh, attributes were housed in one body. It, of course, that literal condition will not occur again, but marriage is intended to bring you back into that place where one flesh, one heart, one mind, agreement, where the female attributes will make up for the male weaknesses, male attributes will make up for the female weaknesses, and together they can experience a condition of life that they cannot experience any other way. And this is something we need to understand. Your level of fruitfulness, your ability to experience increase throughout your life, your ability to exercise a level of dominion and authority over this natural world, these things will never occur without being in right relationship to your husband or your wife. This is an important understanding because it motivates you to make some efforts in arenas or areas that might, might not otherwise be the case. But you can't experience the fullness of God in your life without relating to your husband or wife in the way God says you should. Because that's how one flesh is achieved. And that's where the promise was given. And so that being the case, we can go back to Ephesians 5, verse 22 again. Now let's take another look at some of the verses that we just read. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Well, this just, you know, really uh, is disappointing news to some wives because they feel like, how in the world can I submit unto this ridiculous bozo as unto the Lord? He just does not meet the spiritual standard that needs to be met, and I'm supposed to be submissive to him? Or if we go on reading, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. And, you know, that might be some husbands that would say, How can I do that? All she does is nag me. She doesn't pay much attention to me. She doesn't give me sex every time I want it. The list goes on. And so we have a finger-pointing contest in many marriages that never ends. And, you know, these were, one, this, these were some of the most frustrating parts of my earlier ministry, trying to counsel uh, people who are married that are in trouble. Because it's always, well, look at her. How can I do my part? Or look at him. How can I possibly submit to that? There's some basics we need to understand. First of all, this isn't a commentary on equality in the body of Christ. Men aren't any more important to the Lord than women are. We are all equal in Christ, male, female, Jew, Gentile, bond, or free. The need for authority exists in every group of two or more people. Somebody needs to be in authority. Otherwise, anarchy is the case. Social chaos is the result of anarchy, and that's not part of the Lord's plan. And so he will always assign levels of authority in any group of people. And for the marriage, that happens to have fallen, that lot happens to have fallen to the man. Now, that simply means that if there's an occasion when the husband and wife can agree, rather than there being a stalemate, no progress in any direction, nothing good happening without a decision. Instead of that being the case, God gave someone the decision-making responsibility if agreement is not forthcoming. 
I think every marriage should have its goal of doing and making decisions in agreement. I mean, this doesn't give the man uh, the freedom to approach life as, as if he's got his own little kingdom and he's king of his castle. If we understand what the Word says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. If you actually loved your life, wife that way, and we're willing to lay down your life for her, not that you have to go to the cross, Jesus has already done that, but meaning you give her preferential treatment. You lay down your desires and your needs in order to take care of hers first. That's what loving a wife as Christ loves the church means. And if she was convinced that your leadership of the family meant that you would consider her point of view even before you considered your own, you would never have trouble with her responding to your leadership. Love is what makes authority work. Without love, authority is imposed. And the imposition of authority always produces rebellion. No other possible way. Like the guy that went to a seminar to learn how to be the head of his house. And he came home after a weekend away and said, Honey, I've learned how to be the head of my household. Submit, woman. <laughs> Didn't work out like he thought. Uh, you know, a day or two later, he could open one eye just a little bit. <laughs> Forced submission will always produce rebellion. And so the only way submission works to authority on any level is if it's not forced, if it's voluntary. Leadership in any arena has to be skilled enough relationally to encourage people to follow that lead because they have to do it willingly. Somebody stands up and says, you do what I say because I'm the boss. You're going down the wrong path. Positional authority will always fail, invariably will produce rebellion in the kinds of groups we're talking about now. In the military, positional authority is necessary because on the battlefield, you can't uh, have a consensus building meeting before you engage the enemy. Uh, you know, it requires responsiveness to uh, direction and orders. But unfortunately, you know, uh, even the military needs relationally skilled leaders. Those are the ones that actually make it to the top, that the men want to respond to and follow. And so that's true for marriage. If you want your wife to acknowledge your wonderful leadership skill and your great unfettered judgment in light of the Word of God, always getting it right, if you want her to think of you as her knight in shining armor, you're going to have to begin the process by loving her as Christ loves the church and giving her that sense of security in your decision-making process. And you should make the endeavor to find consensus with your spouse in the important decisions that are made in your family. Those are the ones that, you know, really are going to shape the success of the marriage. But, you know, still, ladies, this means you're going to have to respond to him as you would to the Lord, submit to him. Now, submission doesn't mean blind obedience, okay? Do understand that. Submission recognizes the legitimacy of the, of the authority that someone stands in and expresses a certain esteem for that office. It doesn't mean blind obedience. So how, how does this go then? If he tells you to do something that you don't think is right and you can find in the Word that that's contrary to the purposes of God, then you should lovingly, politely, kindly point that out to him and just say, honey, this is not a path we can go down. This is not a path I'm willing to go down because it's counter to the word. And that's the highest source of authority in our life. So, you know, you always check out the direction that any authority figure gives you. 
against the Word of God and be sure that cooperation with that direction doesn't take you away from the principle of God. Now, I'm speaking of the written Word. It doesn't work to say, no, God told me not to do that. That doesn't work. I'm talking now the written Word, the principles of the Word. If a decision is made that the Bible doesn't spell out <clears throat> what should have been done, then you need to prayerfully go along with the decision he's made if there has been some controversy about it. Believing and praying, praying for him, praying and believing that uh, that decision will be honored by the Lord. If it's the wrong one, that he'll get the word to the husband to make some changes. So submission does not mean blind obedience. Measure what comes by the word, but then... You know, uh, trust the Lord with your husband's judgment. Hopefully there will not be all that many occasions where there is a difference of opinion on the important subjects of your life. I mean, uh, husbands, stay out of the, the minor decision-making. Leave it to your wife. Successful leadership always delegates. Don't try to tell her where she can go to the grocery store or when she can go or when she has to change the kids' diapers. Or, forget all of that. We're talking about decisions aligning your family's best interests with the Lord, not the little nuances of, uh, uh, of, you know, life at home. Individual giftings will resolve these issues most of the time. Or individual callings. I mean, if the husband's at work, he obviously can't change the diapers or can't do a lot of the domestic stuff. Well, what about homes where the wife works and the husband is a stay-at-home dad? Is that scriptural? Yeah, I think so. If both parties to the marriage have agreed to that and that's where her strongest callings and anointings may lie and he is inclined to take care of the house, then hey, that's fine. I know arrangements like that. It just needs to be, you know, something that both parties have bought into. But basically, the arrangement uh, or the, the place that you're to hold in the marriage relationship, whether it be as a husband, loving his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it, or whether it be the wife submitting unto her husband's leadership as unto the Lord, these postures in the marriage are absolutely necessary if you're ever going to become one flesh in that marriage. These define, there are definitions given us by the Lord of how you are to relate to one another if you're going to become one flesh. So if it is your point of view that your husband is just, uh, you know, spiritually, he just hadn't got any sense at all, therefore you're going to have to take charge of that area of the family, that's a wrong and a dangerous kind of approach to the marriage relationship. Unless, in, you know, in his honesty, he understands that you are... Uh, more well-versed in the Word than he is, and that, you know, you're more committed in your pursuit of the Lord than he is, then he will lean on your spirituality, but you can't usurp the authority that God has given him. Only to the extent that we fulfill the roles that God has placed in the Bible that we just looked at. Can we ever expect to come to one flesh where the dominion and the authority over this natural world will be in such evidence in your life uh, that you'll be amazed. It's only going to come out of a marriage where these, these descriptions of roles and responsibilities are in place. And you can't fake it. Husbands, you know, I've heard some husbands say, well, I... I don't feel affection for my wife anymore. I can't, I can't love her like Christ loves the church. Well, the Greek word agape doesn't have anything to do with affection. It means to give. To give unconditionally. And you can give to her. You can give her financial security. You can give her honor and respect 
esteeming who she is, the mother of your children, the guide of the house, whatever it may be. You can respect her, love her, give her, um, you know, the secure, the emotional security of knowing that you're there for her. You're not going to leave her. I mean, there, there are all kinds of ways you can give to her. And here's the funny part about it. If you really want to, you know, cultivate affection for someone, start giving to them on any level that you can. Because the more you give to a person in the areas that you can, maybe it's financial, or maybe it's prayer, or maybe it's, uh, you know, some other possible things that you can do to give from your heart to your spouse. As, as you do that, guys, as you give to your wife every way you can, even if the, you know, the battles over the last 10 years seem to have destroyed the affection, you can rebuild it by starting to give to her from your heart unconditionally like the Lord says. And as you do, and I'm not too sure why this works, but it works, you will start feeling Affection. Yeah, I, I know why it works. Emotions are given to sustain the, deci to sustain the direction uh, our decisions take us. That's what they're there for. When you make a right decision, uh, you may not feel too passionate or excited about it at the outset, but as you proceed down that path, because this is the way the Lord said it needed to be, then eventually, emotionally, you're going to start getting excited about it you're going to start getting behind it with your emotions because that's the part of you that's been given to sustain your decision-making. So you're not going to be wavering like a wave of the sea. You're not going to, you know, a wavering man receives nothing from the Lord. So understand that as you give what you can give to your wife, then that feeling of affection will be generated. And ladies, when you start treating your husband like he is your knight in shining armor. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know this, but he craves that. Every man that's really a man wants to be a man for his woman. She knows him better than anybody else does. And for her to be convinced that he is her knight in shining armor, even if he's just lays around in holy t-shirts and watches soap operas. It's still going to have the effect of pulling him up into that level of how you see him. That's why it's so important that we function in line with these assignments, whether we feel like it or not. If he's not what you want him to be, treat him like he is exactly what you want him to be, and that expectation will pull him there. The Bible says, I've, I've taught this a lot lately, that expectation is the final step to the manifestation of the promise of God you're believing for. Faith gets the answer, right? But the final step in the maturity of your faith is expecting, truly, confidently expecting something to occur. It could be your healing. Until you expect that your healing is going to show up any moment and go up for ministry or, you know, pray that way, act that way at home, wherever the case may be, when you expect it, that's when it's going to happen. The Bible says faith is the substance of things what? Hope for. Hope for. The word hope is confident expectation. Faith will only put substance to the things that you confidently expect. And this has a bearing on your relationships. This is why you need to expect the most out of people. You need to expect the best out of people. You need to have high expectations for them because they tend to rise to the level of the expectation of the authority they're under. I'm trying to preach fast, but this stuff is important. And so when, I mean... Yeah, I mean, neither of us, husbands or wives, are likely to be at the pinnacle of where the other would like us to be. But we can help each other get there by truly expecting that. Yes, right. Expect that because you're praying for them. That's what Paul did with the church at Ephesus in Ephesus 1.17, the Pauline prayer. He prayed that they would understand uh, the hope of their calling 
that they would understand what a precious inheritance they are to God, what the exceeding greatness of power is to us who believe. He prayed that they would understand these things, and that elevated his expectation of them. Because God hears prayer, and he's praying in faith. And so as you pray for somebody, you will elevate your expectation of them. And it is that expectation, if you expect your husband or your wife to step into arenas of responsibility that they haven't really stepped into yet that are scriptural, then, you know, pray for them. Pray and believe and watch your expectation grow and as your expectation demonstrates to them, to that old guy that you really believe he is your knight in shining armor, guess what he'll start to live like? Your knight in shining armor. He'll have your back. He will take care of you. These are things that will occur. And the reverse is true. Well, anyway... All right. Well, there's, there's, you know, I have done literally in times past, um, Sunday after Sunday, a series of teachings on marriage. So this is not intended to be a really comprehensive overview. But I want you to see that this is necessary for you to come into the authority and the dominion that God wants you to operate with. I mean, if, if you're trying to exercise authority over negative circumstance and your, your words seem to fall about two inches out of your mouth, it's not working, you don't seem to have any authority there, this is one of the places you'll look. Because the promise is to each marriage being populated by a man and a woman who take the responsibilities that Scripture grants them. That's how they will move into this condition of one flesh and begin exercising the authority that uh, God granted humanity to have over this natural arena. But I would suggest that a couple of other things also depend on it. In verse 26, after husbands are told to love your wives as Christ loves the church, he goes on to say that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. I would say that the separation of your marriage unto the Lord, which is what sanctification is, and the extent to which your marriage is based on the Word of God will depend on your taking your assigned positions of responsibility that God gives you. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. If you as a believer... Uh, want to be a glorious church. When it talks about the church, it could apply to you individually or it could apply, it could apply corporately to a church like we are here. But our goal should be to glorify the Lord in the earth and to experience the glory of the Lord. That is His manifest presence, power, grace, person. I would suggest that will not happen to any greater a degree then you are taking your scriptural place in your marriage. And then lastly, of course, the, the authority that is part of the dominion we were created to exercise is going to reflect that same thing. And so verse 28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. This is a truth that helps you stay focused. Uh, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Body, flesh, and bones, not spirit. This is going to get a lot more explanation next Sunday. If it's putting a little question mark in your mind. For this cause... Because this has to do with our relationship to Jesus Christ. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be <coughs> one flesh. So we've defined what one flesh in the marriage relationship is. When we begin considering one flesh with the Lord, you know, I used to, I used to teach that 
okay, if we're going to be one with the Lord, you know, does that mean then that, uh, you know, he's in me, therefore I'm one with him? Or is it more appropriate to say I'm in him, in Christ? Does that mean I'm one with the Lord? Uh, how exactly does this come about? Well, this is really the subject of next Sunday's sermon, so I'm not going to get in, into it too deeply. But I used to teach that when a person's born again, then they automatically have Christ in them, which I have changed my mind about. Um, because very simply, I've run across enough Scripture that indicates otherwise that I believe when somebody gets saved, you know, they're made a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit dwells in you even before you're filled with the Holy Spirit by measure. And so essentially, uh, since the Godhead is a triune or is a trinity, then that means if you are got the Holy Ghost in you, which you do when you're born again, because he is the agent of sanctification, uh, then in the person of the Holy Spirit, indirectly speaking, you know, in the person of the Holy Spirit, you're indwelled also by God the Father and God the Son. So yeah, you could say in that regard, uh, you have all members of the Godhead within you. But the reference in the word to Christ in you does not occur when you are born again. Paul said to the church at Galatia, he said, Little children, now this is an adult church, but they're children in the Lord. They had just gotten saved. They're like, you know, on a spiritual plane, they're like little children. And he says, I cease not to pray for you that Christ be formed in you. So this is a process that occurs after you're saved. And it has to do with becoming one in him. And this is the most important consideration of all that we become one flesh with him. It's a great mystery. We'll talk about it next Sunday. So you don't want to miss next Sunday. I'm so glad you had the opportunity to tune in to today's broadcast. If you want to keep in touch with our ministry, sign up to receive our Winner's Way weekly email. Every Friday, you'll receive encouragement, information on our next broadcast, and details about upcoming events. You can visit our website to sign up. That's all the time I have for today. Have a great week, and as always, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.